If I would make a film about myself, I would be the voiceover. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Nobody else in any conversation pays as much attention to what is being said as I do. Everything that comes out of your mouth is important. Suddenly your thoughts are my thoughts. I am you. So I see this superhero as a lawyer, the man who leads, the man who controls the whole situation, the man who is in the courtroom. I see the animal, I see it as a witness because it's vulnerable. They were prey during the war. That's why I see a witness in this animal. The ways I associate with myself, an interpreter. The only purpose of a vase is to hold a flower. And our sole purpose here in this triangle is to provide interpretation, to facilitate the conversation and nothing else. I must sound composed. You don't need to know what is going on in my heart. It's important to give emotions, but I shouldn't be telling you, oh, by the way, this hurts me as well. Um, do you believe that your sons are alive today? No. No, they're not alive. Yankee knows that. I would like to know in which grave they are, so that me, their mother, can give them proper burial, so I can go and visit the place where their bodies are, so I can look at their graves. All rise, Pueblo The International Criminal Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia is now in session. Please be seated. I'm safe in my bubble, between the walls of my booth, behind my glass. But then, the person I'm interpreting says something that pierces my bubble and comes back home to me. One day, in trial, we are seeing a video showing Serbian forces who are forcing this one Muslim prisoner to shout and communicate with other Muslims hiding around in the neighboring hills. He's yelling to them, come, come here. The Serbs are not gonna harm you. They're not gonna do anything to you. Don't worry, just come. I've seen that video already seven times and I know where the graves are of that man and of the men who are hiding up there in the hills. Something chokes in me and I hand the microphone over to my colleague because I want to cry. I know that if I try and say one word, tears will come and strange sounds muffled and unintelligible.
this was a hotel room where we met with one witness. It was just uh, one of those hotel rooms that are you know same everywhere. A big bed and a chair where uh, the witness was sitting and uh, the two of us, the investigator and myself. While being on a mission in Scandinavia, one of the places we visited was the home of an elderly couple. We sat down with them in their living room. The painting of a Yaitse waterfall on the wall. The photos on the shelves were of their two sons. As we Progressed with the statement, I learned that these two boys were taken to a concentration camp in 1992. They were never found, they were never returned, their remains had not been found. And uh, the story itself was very sad and, and terrible, but what struck me the most was when we asked uh, the couple if if or, or the man, actually, if he would like to have protective statements, should he be called to testify? He said, oh, yes, please, because if they hear that I am testifying in the courtroom, they might kill my boys, they might hurt them. And then I realized that they, after eight years, they still believed that their children are alive. And that was just heartbreaking. Very, very hard to hear. I discovered that it's very, very important to sit in the middle of legal client and a victim. And I also never wanted to look at any of them. I always looked at the side because I never really wanted to, to, to have witness or victim turn around to me and say, well, you explain to him, you're Bosnian, you've been through the war, explain to him how all these things happened because I cannot explain anything to anyone. I'm not there. I'm a glorified phone. But several times I allowed myself to look at the, at the victim, to start feeling for that person. And it didn't really work out very well. The last time was um, a couple of years ago. It was in uh, Srebrenica. We were interviewing uh, drivers who were driving uh, men and boys to get killed. There was this driver and he started to tell a story about how he uh, drove with a boy, a Muslim boy, and they were singing with all these men waiting to be driven to execution in the trunk in the back. And the driver said, and when we were finished, I didn't really know what to do with the boy. I called back to the headquarters and the duty officer got up. He drove for 45 minutes. He went into the truck. He picked up a boy, took him to the bushes and he killed him. I couldn't process it. Who gets up at three, four, five o'clock in the morning to kill a boy? Um, I uh, came home that evening and uh, I started drinking. 
and I was drunk for a month. I wanted the energy of that boy, I wanted it in my home. And I wanted to be devastated for him because he didn't have anyone else to cry for him. Anushka camp was operational for quite a long time. It's the camp that it was the first uh, discovery by Western journalists of something really wrong going on in, in Bosnia. There was a taxi driver who, who kept coming each evening, you know, like would ask the guards to select one or two prisoners and then he would just spend the evening beating the guy. And there was this witness, so I interpreted for him twice in courtroom, in two cases. And he was a doctor. He managed to get a camera smuggled in. And then he decided to do something so incredibly brave. He took photos of the people he was treating, of their wounds, of their bruises documenting what was going on just in case he survives and can show that to the world. He wanted to make sure that later nobody can say it didn't happen. I, I asked once to give me a tape of his, um, his testimony and I have, I have a recording somewhere. I was that impressed. There's a computer, the microphones, a desk and two chairs. The glass of the booth is tinted. This gives me space to distance myself. I get less involved that way. It is different when I do consecutive interpretation, when I'm sitting at the same table with the witness or the accused. When I can smell them, they become more human to me, and it makes it harder to distance yourself. Just imagine, this youngest boy I had, those little hands of his, how could they be dead? Every morning I wake up, I cover my eyes, not to look at other children going to school and husbands going to work, holding hands. <laughs> hey. It is just words, don't worry. Take it easy, listen to me. With my voice and choice of words, I can make any sentence less of a confrontation while still giving a correct interpretation.
my first job with the ICTY was actually just upon the discovery of the secondary mass graves of Srebrenica men and boys. I was invited by Srebrenica team to accompany them to a place where they suspected there was a secondary mass grave. Of course, we came prepared with the archaeologists, with uh, um, excavators and um, all that equipment for rough digging and also for fine-tuning. And um, they started digging. The uh, smell of uh, decaying flesh is just absolutely unbearable. It was very um, overpowering. I didn't really want to approach the area. I didn't really want to, to go and see. One of the archaeologists started talking to me and she said, well, did you go to see the corpses and so on? And I said, uh, no. And she said, uh, uh, why don't you go and see what they did to your people? And then I looked at her and I thought to myself, well, she's absolutely right. If I was born 20 kilometers to the right, this could have been my uh, corpse in this uh, mass grave. And I got up and I went to see. I looked at all those corpses there and uh, their smell didn't really, wasn't all that overpowering for me anymore. I looked at them and uh, uh, I said uh, the uh, Muslim prayer for the dead and uh, um, I felt good about myself and felt good about what I have done, that I saw them, that could have been me. Yeah, I didn't like going to the detention unit because I didn't like having any sort of contact with the, with the accused. I don't feel comfortable because I met their victims and I worked with their victims first and all of a sudden I'm thrown into the detention unit to interpret for the person responsible for their suffering. I suffered during the war and I understand the suffering of the people who came to testify. But it is weird when you, know, when you meet a guy who was in the paramilitaries and like five minutes uh, before he was uh, talking about uh, capturing guys, putting a, a rat on his stomach, covering the rat with a pot and heating the pot so that the rat could dig out the guts of the guy who was alive. Can you imagine that? He said that story in the proofing session. Like, I don't want to be, you know, alone in the room with this guy. Protect me. You feel uncomfortable because you know, had we met 15 years ago, I would have been the victim for sure. There was a story about uh, these two famous doctors, actually, and they were put into concentration camps because they were Muslim intellectuals. They kept them in the toilet. And the guards, they would come there, they would just bring them out, they would beat them up. And I think that they actually killed them by beating both of them. And I kept on having a reoccurring dream that I'm actually in the toilet and that the concentration camp card is knocking at my door. And I called my grandmother. 
and I told her about the dream. And she told me, asked me, do you know who they were, those people who were knocking at, at your door? And I said, no, I don't. She said, they were actually angels. They were there to let you know that you are doing your job right. The knowledge that somebody might be looking at me and scrutinizing my interpretation really helped me to do my job the way the dead people I'm interpreting about would want me to. I said to myself, well, I'm going to be the best fucking interpreter there was. If there are angels watching or the ghosts of those dead people, well, you know what, guys? You can count on me.